everyone. You're watching We Heart Therapy, the special series EFT talk. I'm your host, Dr. Anna Babugati, licensed marriage and family therapist and certified EFT supervisor and therapist here in fabulous Las Vegas, Nevada. I'm so excited to welcome back today, George Fowler. Of course, he's the president of the New York Center for Emotionally Focused Therapy. He's the licensed marriage and family therapist and a certified EFT trainer and supervisor, and he is phenomenal. And he's going to talk to us today about working with withdrawers and withdrawal re-engagement. And thank you so much, George, for just coming back to our show. Thanks for having me, Annabelle. It's uh, some fun times we find ourselves in, right? Right. <laughs> I know everyone's dealing with the coronavirus right now, so it's good to have some, some outreach and some you know, psychoeducation to help keep us going as we try to do this model called EFT. And, you know, with jars, it seems, you know, I'm, I keep my ear to the ground. I try to listen to where everyone gets stuck and I get a lot of feedback about with jars and, you know, the way that they withdraw, the way you work with them seems to have a very diverse spread, but Let's just start a little more broad in general. And George, if you could maybe offer us kind of a general snapshot of, you know, what are these positions of pursue and withdraw and how do we understand those as perhaps different than an attachment style such as anxious or avoidant or disorganized? All right. So where do we start? I mean, everybody's got their own style for how they organize the material. And for me, even the concepts of pursue and withdraw they have much more in common than they have what makes them different. So I, I want to start off with that. Right? It's the same emotions, the same attachment needs. I mean, how do we focus on their humanity? The categories themselves just make it a little bit easier to attune to. So, right, if you know a pursuer is susceptible to messages of rejection and withdrawers failure, it just makes your attunement a little bit easier. But ultimately, I find myself in first learning EFT, it's helpful to have these categories. But as we get, you practice more, sometimes those categories can get in the way because you have some agenda in your head on how it's supposed to go. And then you're not actually working in the present moment. I've never met a pursuer who doesn't sometimes withdraw. And I've never met a withdrawer who sometimes doesn't pursue. The key is how do you pivot and move with what is actually working in session? what they're doing alive instead of kind of trying to force them into a, a box that you can understand. Yeah. And I think that's part of the organizing everything and understanding the moves is by helping to understand who's pursuing and withdrawing. But I noticed that also can get kind of complicated in stage two when, you know, you're working maybe with the couple sex relationship and maybe the cycles flipped and now the person who normally withdraws emotionally is pursuing sexually, you know, or you have pursuers who will pursue superficially for contact, but, you know, underneath when you try to move closer to their emotions, they avoid like the plague. So it's not really the same thing as their attachment style because you have withdrawers who are anxious as well. And you have pursuers who are avoidant as well. So it's not quite the same thing. Right. And that's why you need the flexibility to move as their strategies move. Because even if I have an avoiding attachment style, there's going to be some times where I'm coming out and I'm taking risks. Right. And in those moments, I'm actually more pursuing. Right. It might be quicker for me to go back. But it, ultimately, even the term withdrawal is somewhat pathologized. I mean, we're, we're, we're in the business of getting people to come towards, right? So these people who tend to go away bring up a lot of reactivity in all of us. I like to even change the language right from the get-go that a withdrawer is really a protector, right? Even that word, that change in name allows me to be non-pathologizing, right? We wouldn't be here as a species if, if we didn't learn how to turn down feelings, stay calm under pressure, right? This is incredibly adaptive. It's how withdrawers fit in. It's how they feel good. There's so many good qualities about being able to do this. So I want to start off with that. I'm always trying to connect with what's before me before before I stretch people and try to get them to see the cost of something, right? So even out of the gate, when we see we're talking about withdrawers, start off with honoring that mm -hmm. before we get into the problems of that. 
Yeah, I think that's a really good point. It seems that when therapists come into sessions with their pursuer and withdrawers, they kind of get out in front and they're trying to stretch the withdrawer from the get-go. Let's let's hurry up and get you to be present or stay engaged. And it's too early for them. That is captures the essence of most struggles with withdrawal, right? They're well trained to pick up when emotion is increasing and they have all these strategies to, to turn it down. And the therapist's job is to kind of get them more emotional. So it's a setup to miss each other, right? So how do you recognize and, and stretch their capacity to do more emotions? Yeah. And so this is, so it seems like the, in general, you know, while everyone else does seem to organize the pursuer and withdrawer, it's more of just their move in the cycle. Are they moving away? Are they moving towards not in out of a, a sense of judgment, but just out of a sense of organization. You're just noticing who's moving towards outwardly and who's just pulling away or who's turning away. Well, not to make it even more complicated, but it's really the motivation of the behavior because sometimes withdrawers move towards, but they're moving towards to placate their partner and calm down the emotion. So it's really what they're, what's the goal of their move as far as they're trying to increase the emotion or decrease the emotion? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And I think that's why it gets so convoluted with avoidant attachment. Oftentimes it goes hand in hand, but you know, I think avoidant attachment is just, I can't deal with this. I can't even let myself get close. It's so much deeper than just how they deal with the emotion, right? Withdrawers might turn down the emotion because, you know, maybe they don't want to avoid it, but they just don't see a path to success in it if it's loud in their partner. So they turn it down, not necessarily as a bad thing, but tr- it's just their strategy to try to find a path towards peace together. I like to tell my couples, my supervisees, it really is a simple math equation. Withdrawers learn to pull away from emotion because when they stay in it, it doesn't work so well for them. All withdrawal reengagement is, is, is helping them experience success with emotions, right? When they experience success, their muscle memory starts, starts to shift and they want to do more of that. So really that's what we're trying to do. Not work too hard here. How do we hold up the mirror in a loving way and help withdrawers stay present and experience that success? Yeah. And that brings up a, a very important point is how is our work with withdrawers going to look different in stage one versus stage two? So we know stage two starts with withdrawal re-engagement, but you know, when they come in and the withdrawer, you know, let's just go with the most extreme examples, you know, where you have withdrawers that just say, I don't have any feelings. There's no reason to have them. I have no needs, you know? And so how are you, where are you moving the needle in move in stage one to get them from that place to where yeah. we know they're ready for stage two? You know, stage one is really about getting their buy into the process. They have good reasons why they don't want to do vulnerability. Therapists love the word vulnerability. Withdrawers hold that traditional word. It's being open to attack or weakness. They don't want to do it for good reasons. They've been trained not to. So you really got to get them to understand, be explicit about your process. What are you trying to get them to do? What are the benefits of doing it? As they see their partner starting to calm down and really appreciate what they're doing, right? They take it less personal. Stage one is really they're still focused on performance, but they're performing better now. They're starting to get educated on what's expected of them. They have some success doing that, right? The system starts to calm down, but ultimately they're still doing emotions for their partner. The difference in stage two is you're really trying to get withdrawers to experience success for themselves, right? They really start to get the benefits of the emotional process and vulnerability. And, you know, that part of them that starts to stand up, not to placate their partner or to perform, but because they want it. Really, you're seeing a a reduction of the fears and it's starting to replace with longings, right? It's those longings, which are so good at stopping the bad 
on, and being on the defense that there's not a lot of room left over for what they want in their hearts to improve in these emotional places. That's a real radical difference in stage two, right? They're re-engaging for themselves, not for their partner. So in stage one, would you be helping them? Would Maybe the goal would be to help them stay present. Mm-hmm. And stage two, you're kind of taking that to the next level, which is engagement. But maybe by the end of stage one, you're going for just present, just the ability to tolerate the emotional space with their partner and just stay around as opposed to retreating. Exactly. Presence. But to have presence, they have to have some success. So what am I trying to do in stage one? A perfect example, when a withdrawer says, I don't know. Right. Most therapists are like, "Uh oh, wait a second. If you don't know, I don't know. Your partner doesn't know. Now we're all going to start pushing that withdrawer. We know what they're going to do. I'm trying to train myself to say, when they say, I don't know, be like, yes, we're, this is the opportunity. How could they know? This has never been an option. They never really look at this and try to put words to it. Celebrate that they don't have words. Help them recognize that not knowing is exactly where they're supposed to be, right? It's that, it's that process that they feel like they're, getting, they're doing something well that makes them want to do more of it. Mm-hmm. But what about also the type of withdrawers where, you know, they don't necessarily go to not knowing, but you can tell that they're completely in their head and that they're giving you the socially acceptable response of what that emotion should be. Like, I see my wife in pain. I know she, I know sad is the appropriate thing, but you as the therapist and their partner aren't buying into it because you know that it's all intellectual. That's the difference. I am buying into it. What I mean by that, that is a live strategy in the moment that they're employing, right? So when a withdrawer goes to their head or tries to give advice or focuses or makes a joke or, you know, deflects or minimizes, all of these strategies are live strategies that are trying to turn down emotion. They're much better at emotions than we give them credit for with drawers. They have perfect timing. You could almost, it's, it's like clockwork. When their partner's emotion starts to rise, expect one of these moves to kick in. And instead of seeing that as an exit or them not wanting to do emotion, point it out to them in a way that says, Annabelle, you are so good at that. Right. Every time George says something that you feel might head this conversation in a wrong direction, you make a joke. I mean, you're so resilient. You are so creative in how you do things. Like, do you even notice that you do that? I'm trying to bring attention to these moves that withdrawers are doing in session that are all about emotions. They just don't have the language to describe what they're doing. They need my help. To, really, I want to help them recognize they are so much better at emotions than we give them credit for, right? So that laugh that has bad timing, I mean, how many times have you seen this in session where the pursuer starts talking about something intense and then here comes the joke from the withdrawer and then the pursuer rolls their eyes and we're like shaking our head like, are you kidding me? Like when right. I see that now, they going to turn and share and they start busting out into laughter all of a sudden. Right. But imagine if you were to withdraw and I would say to you, wow, Annabelle, I just, just notice, you know, what good timing you have, right? You know, what are you trying to do? So these moves that they have, I'm trying to name them and I'm trying to honor the function of what they're trying to do. Right. When we do that, it helps withdrawers recognize, you know, wait a second, I do do a lot of these emotions and I have good reasons for why I want to do these emotions. To me, that's really what stage one work is about. It's helping withdrawers notice what they're doing and actually what they're looking for in these moves. That's when they start to buy into the process and say, hmm, that's interesting. Maybe there are different ways of me doing that that are, would, could be more successful. So could you give us maybe a, an example of something how you, something you might say um, to make this process explicit to the withdrawal in stage one to explain to them why it is that we're going after emotions? Yeah, I think that getting their buy-in psych ed is really important for people who live in their heads and that's where they find safety. So often we're pushing for these big words like that must make you feel scared or lonely. And that's that's only increasing the emotional temperature. They don't want that. So I want to stay in their head. What is it like to not feel clear? What is it like to feel confused? What is it like when things you lose structure, when things are not predictable? Like meet them in that place, right? And start helping them start realizing that's all emotion. 
every time that that withdrawal goes to their head, going to their head is buying them time, right? Taking space for a withdrawal is what makes them feel calm, right? So we need to recognize in session when they're taking space, they're not doing that to reject their partner. They're taking safe space to actually find a little bit of safety. So if I ask a withdrawal what they feel and they look up and I see them looking up because they're trying to figure it out, they're taking some space because their experiences, if they can figure it out and give the right answer, then things are going to calm down. But if they don't, they're in trouble. So I want to meet them in their head and say, wow, I just noticed you did that. You looked up, right? Because if you're able to give me, give the answer, that would feel like what? Oh, and what happens if you give the wrong answer? That would feel mm -hmm. like what? Right. And now I'm meeting them in this place of pressure. There's always feelings attached to where where people are in their head. Most therapists think that's an exit. Stop doing that. Let me get you into your body and your feelings. No, go up into their head and just help them find the feelings that are there. So when you get them into their head and you, when you meet them in their head and you know that they're describing emotions there, but they are cut off from their body. I mean, isn't that something we're supposed to be going after in EFT is helping them to start connecting it to their body? We're trying to make explicit then what's blocking them from getting in touch with their body. So if I say, yeah, Annabelle, I love how you try to figure things out because figuring things out is what's always made you feel safe in the world. And if you don't know how to figure things out, where do you think that would lead you? And you'd say, I don't know, pretty in a, in a tough spot. I have the best chance of going to the body when it's alive in the room. So I might say to you, wow, even as you say that tough spot, do you notice that anywhere? Because a lot of times when, when, when we feel tough, our body will communicate. A lot of times we don't listen to that, but I'm going to every time just ask you to check because sometimes people feel that in their stomach or in their chest. It's a lot easier to, when you invite somebody, when it's alive in a room, most of us are talking about last week's fight. We don't have any real triggers in a room. And then we wonder why withdrawers don't have any, any answers to when we ask about their body. But I can guarantee you this, and this is a big takeaway for people listening. Because they don't know how to go to their body, even means more how we have to help them. Every session, I am going to be asking this withdrawal where they feel out in their body. The beauty of going to the body is, one, it guarantees it's alive in the room. Yeah. So we're working with real emotion. We're not just hypothetically working with emotion. And two, it's giving me these physical markers. Like, where do you feel that fear or that pain, what the failure? Once I have those locations, once I get the sharing and the partner's response in this, I'm expecting that to shift, right? I'm going to measure my work. I'm seeing if it's progressing. It's also giving me the block. So that's what I started out. When you're saying I can't go to my body, I would say, hmm, that's interesting because you were really helping me understand this hard place, but you don't notice that anywhere in your body. So do you find yourself kind of trying to figure out how you're supposed to answer that question? Is what's blocking the body that you can see the wheels spinning? If the focus is on the racing thoughts, it's hard to notice your own body. Mm -hmm. So in that moment when they can't go to their body, they're going to give me what's stopping it. Now I'm going to shift towards that. I really like that because the mega withdrawers that I have that are super intellectual, you know, when you ask them, what do you feel in their body? They're like nothing. Like, you know, even if you got a live trigger, you know, when you, when you can't figure things out, if you were to give your wife the wrong answer right now or your spouse, you know, they, they're like, well, I'm not giving, you know, we've, we're not in that fight or we're not in anything right now. I'm not worried about that. I don't feel it in my body, <laughs> you know, and they're look, just look like. What you just did what was beautiful. That's what I mean, exploring the block. If what this, this withdrawer is saying is me going to my body runs the risk of giving more information that might be used against me, that might be misinterpreted. Why would I want to do that? Right. I have the most safety staying up here and trying to anticipate what I'm supposed to say, because that's what I've been trained to do. If we want withdrawers to do it differently, they got to have success. Maybe their partner can't, but I can as a therapist notice that. So imagine if I would say that to you, I'd say, I go, wow, that makes so much sense. Well, you want to go to your body. If the quick assessment you're doing is if you go there and give the wrong answer, it's going to make things worse. Or maybe it will be used against you. I wouldn't want to go to my body either. Mm -hmm. What's that like for you to hear, Annabelle? Hmm. That's really good. I like that. I'm going to use that one for sure. That's where, you know, that's a big, a big stuck place. And this, 
you know, moves into stage two with the withdrawers is, you know, I like how you made that beautiful distinction that, you know, in stage one, yes, they're still kind of performing in the emotions for their partner and in withdrawal re-engagement, we're helping them prioritize emotions for themselves. And one of the biggest things that I've run into in withdrawal re-engagement is withdrawers who will say that they're that they don't have any needs that they're fine as long as everyone else is happy which you know is kind of like an external thing it's not an internal this is what i need to feel happy it's as long as there's no chaos then i'm i've learned to survive which really doesn't tell me anything about their needs other than i just don't like to live with drama <laughs> well it gives us a real window into into their humanity Right, that's a pretty logical thing when your body is assessing for threat, that there's less room for the longing, right? So if if my partner's happy and that means we're not fighting and that means the emotion is is low, then that's a real hold on a second. That's a real safe place for them. So internet almost went out. Oh, oh that's okay. <laughs> All right. So how do I not see that as them being defensive? But that's just a script that they were given. That wasn't a choice. They're not trying not to know what they need. It's just a byproduct of their experiences, right? Not fighting is a huge win for them, right? Because we need to keep reminding ourselves low emotional reactivity is what means safety for them. So not fighting is really is what they're looking for. When they're coming into therapy, they will be very happy if that's the outcome. They don't even recognize that there's something so much more than just less reactivity, mm. right? So that's why in stage one, I'm trying to honor that. But in stage, truth, in stage two, now that they're starting to get through all their moves, the good reasons they're doing what they're doing, they start to recognize, wait a second, but where does that leave me? Ultimately, every time one of these strategy kicks in, the moment it's kicking in, I'm trying with the withdrawer to say, what is happening in that moment? Because when you understand that moment, that's actually their moment of greatest need, right? That's when they're anxious, they're afraid they might fail, they're feeling helpless, they're not sure on what to do. That's why these strategies are kicking in and nobody even sees it. They don't see it in themselves. What's so tragic when you're working with withdrawers is because people were not there for them and they learned to self-soothe and to, to not be emotional, they've le learned to do to themselves exactly what was done to them, right? Yeah. So I want to start to uncover that in stage two to get them to see, but who sees you? Who yeah. sees you in these moments? Everybody's paying attention to your pursuer who's feeling rejected and is, is vocalizing that. Who's actually seeing that place in you when you don't know what to do, when you're feeling stuck, when you feel like you're getting it wrong? It's pretty tragic that the best thing they want is just to be left alone so the storm could pass. They don't even look for people to come and help them in it. Yeah. And you said something super, super key too, which is the, you know, when they've been left alone, they've been taught to self-soothe. They've been taught not to look to others for their needs as a resource to meet their needs. So Worse when, than that, they get them blamed for not doing it, right? Yeah. Nobody shows up for them. They do the most resilient thing they can do is they figure out how to best self-soothe. And then they don't know how to be there for their partner's emotions and they're blamed for that when that is the math equation. Right, right. So now... So in stage two, you're talking about, you know, meeting them in that place, really validating how this developed, you know, the good reasons they have for it. And I think it's, it's so important to kind of usher that part forward about, well, of course, when the storm is calm, you know, even when it comes to, you know, simple things like needing to feel good about yourself right? You're not used to seeking your partner's opinion or seeing them as a resource of love to help, help you feel good. You got, a, you got a big business meeting that day. You just go into your head and you start boosting yourself and you're, they're self-soothing and they're self-meeting their needs and they don't even realize that they're, that's going on. So it's shifting that frame from meeting their own needs internally and whatever those needs are to relationally including their partner and part of that world, which usually helps the pursuer feel a lot closer 
they feel needed and wanted when their partner seeks them out? It's not either or, right? It's an end both scenario. We don't want withdrawers to lose this ability to self-soothe and differentiate, right. right? We just want them to have the flexibility to do both, right? Mm -hmm. When the option is to have your partner there for you, co-regulation is the best way of handling stress, right? So we want them to be able to handle stress on their own and to know when to turn towards their partner. That's about the flexibility. It's really important. Most therapists, you know, want, they send the vibe that they want to turn withdrawers into pursuers. Mm. Right? And we really want to recognize the value of their withdrawal and how that being calm under pressure is something we don't want to change. Right. And then in stage two, we're actually helping them to experience success. Why wouldn't you want to do more emotions if doing emotions enriched your life? Right. Right. Well, I'm just, I'm thinking in this moment too, how, how deep do we go? How do we know when it's enough for the relationship? You know, cause as you said, you know, allowing them to maintain both, but if their proclivity is to continue to meet their own needs and they're really not including their partner in that, they're not still not having that flexibility at meeting their own needs. They're just, why do I need to go to my partner and, and ask her to, you know, tell me that I'm, you know, that she thinks I'm a stellar employee or I'm going to do great at this meeting today. You know, why do I need her to do that for me when I can do that for myself? And the partner's over there like, I so want to be part of your world. I want to know who you are as a human being and what makes you tick and that I'm included in these spaces that you don't share with anybody. And they just, you know, how deep are we talking? Well, we're talking deep, but it's all about the pacing of the deep. That really what matters. So let me, I want you to remind me after I, I say something about the pacing, but you know, what we're trying to do in EFT is pretty audacious. We are, withdrawers shouldn't do this. If we were just looking at the history of their experiences, they shouldn't do this. I mean, what are we asking them to do in stage two? We're saying, all right, I want you to focus on all the things you've been trained to do your whole life fixing things, performance, focusing on others, anticipating, going to your head, all of that stuff that you know makes you feel safe. And we want you to stop doing that. That's not easy to do, but this is going to get harder. And instead of focusing on all those things, performing, we want you to focus inwardly on your emotional world. That seems like that's so counterintuitive because I don't want to increase emotion. I want to decrease emotion. And as we're getting them to look inward, we're not wanting them to focus on all the good inward parts where they feel competent and strong and, you know, confident. No, no, we're not doing that. We want you to focus on the insecurities where you feel weak, pathetic, ugly, stupid. How does that sound? Not so great. And then when it feels like they can't tolerate anymore, we want them to share their worst parts of themselves with the person who tells them they're getting it wrong all the time. Withdrawers should never do this, but they do it all the time. That is the great news. And this is the target that we're aiming for. There's something within every withdrawer that knows better. Their, their heart knows they do better in darkness with people coming closer to them, right? We just need to make the environment safe to allow the longing to come out. This is the natural process. I don't care how much a withdrawer has been trained. There's something inside them that knows better. Right. And that's the really good news of what we're doing. It's about creating the safety. And, and when you see this with withdrawers, and I work with some of the most shut down withdrawers you'll ever see, when they start to see the benefit for them to engage and they start to have some success, they don't shut up. They got years of makeup to do, right? They really start to open up in a different way. But what I wanted you to remind me of, because of that target is so powerful, it just causes most therapists to come out of the gates way too fast, pushing way too much to want to get to this beautiful side of withdrawal. But they really, they get disarmed by all the defenses they have in place that kind of stop that. So to me, that's the greatest challenge. How can you capture live strategies, laughter, focusing on the positive, right? Deflection, minimizing advice. These are all in session things they're doing that are trying to turn down emotional heat. How do you show them that? Hold up the mirror in a way that they're like, oh, that's me. When you tell them it makes sense what they're trying to do, and they're like, oh, okay, I make sense, right? That validation from you to therapist is helping them in moments actually re-engage. To me, that's the harder work in stage one 
that sets the 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 environment to do the deeper work in stage two. But if we have a good platform in stage one, we're we're good to go in that stage two. Now help me a little bit more. So there's another class of withdrawers that I've met that have not had much adversity in their life. And their view of themselves is generally positive. They don't really, you know, I've had withdrawers say they've never had any loss in their life. They've never been insulted, you know, so they don't know what it's like to feel insecure. And so teaching them how to tune into a longing to feel loved, you know, it's like, well, I just already feel loved naturally. So I don't turn and talk to my partner because I don't need to ask for anything. I mean, those are really hard withdrawers to crack into. Absolutely. And I, again, I feel like my job is to be a translator, to really try to stay present. I know what I have in my corner is this, we're born wanting connection, especially in places of insecurity. So this withdrawer is saying, life has shown me no hurt, so therefore I don't need anything. There's something about that story that I'm not really understanding. So I would just try to open up space to say, that's pretty cool. Like, how are you able to do that? Most of us, when we're feeling insecure, you know, we do something with that, right? So what do you do with it? You you just, you know, so I guess that's what I'd be encouraging. Yes, when you have an intellectual withdrawal who seems to have no access to their feelings, we start to believe that they don't have feelings, But what I'm saying is, even as you're asking them that question, they're feeling something with that question. They might think you're you're asking them a question they don't have the answer to. After they give you the answer, you can see them kind of scanning. Did you like the answer to that question? Did they get a good job? Did they kind of fail with that question? What is that? That's all live emotion. So as, as if you would ask me that question, or, you know, say, say you to withdraw, and I asked you and you said to me, no, George, I don't really have any feelings, right? I might say to you, Annabelle, that's really good. I like how quick you answered that question. It's like, you know what, if, if, I, if I, we all agree that's the case, then where would that leave you? That, you know, you've just had a really good life and you really just haven't had a lot of insecurities. So if I would buy into that, what do you think that would do the, for the emotion for the withdrawal? Calm them, maybe? That's what they're looking for. They're hoping to not have me come at them and push them. And yet that's what most of us would do as therapists. I would see that as an exit and I'd say, Annabelle, Annabelle, are you kidding me? You've had no bad moments in your life. Nothing of insecurity. You've had such a safe, well, let, let's go into that. And already my vibe is telling you what? It's attacking you saying you're wrong, that your experience is not right. I'm increasing the emotional temperature. And I know what that's going to do with you. It's just going to entrench those defenses that are well in place to turn down emotional temperature. Mm-hmm. What I'm trying to get all you listeners to do is to, to when you see these moves, instead of fighting these moves, help them see the good reasons they're doing it. What you're saying is a brilliant strategy. If everybody, if your partner and your therapist would just agree that you don't have a lot of insecurity, that saves you a lot of work. Mm-hmm. And if if they really do not have a lot of insecurity, how do you tune them into a longing for connection? I mean, like, how would you enter into that where where it seems pretty simplified? Like, because I feel generally positive all the time, and and I have a out, positive outlook on my wife, I don't find myself feeling the need to open up or share silly opinions about how my day at work went or, you know, I already feel good and I already feel connected. You're wrong. See, again, we're trying to go too deep to get into the insecurities. I want to just meet him where he's at. Or she's, what, what he's saying is, you know, I am positive and yet my wife wants more and that's causing what in him? A frustration? It's causing, you know, and, and, can he communicate that? Does he feel like his wife understands what that's like? I mean, if I was in a positive place and you were in a positive place and that means we're safe, but you can't stay in that positive place, that's going to be pretty frustrating for me. And when I can't fix it and I can't do anything to change that, that's also a hard place for me. So what I'm saying is there's plenty of insecurity in there. 
I just got to help find it when it's alive instead of trying to go to these deep places where the little boy was locked in a closet and daddy did bad things. Right. Right. Well, that was in that moment that he can't do that with his wife is causing some emotion. It might be a helpless feeling. It might be a, you know, and even those words helpless, they're too quick, too fast. I want to stay with that must be hard. That must be challenging. That must be confusing. Those are safer words for which are to kind of come alongside than these bigger emotional words. So can you keep that in the back of your mind that the words you're using to describe their experience can't be too loaded emotionally, right? right? I'll go to words are usually fear, failure, scary, sad, hurt. Most of those words, too big a words for them. Yeah. They're more like frustration is usually where they live. Frustration, disappointment. Yeah, those are, those are much closer words because if in my heart, I do think I'm a pretty happy guy and you want more of me, but I don't really feel like there is any, you don't, should, I don't want any more of me. I like what I'm already showing the world, but that seems to not be enough for you. That's going to do something to me, right? There's something there live that I can work with without needing to go to these deeper places. The beauty of the process tells us where we need to go. So often as therapists, we're working too hard to try to, we, we want our clients to be where we want them. We're not meeting them where they're at, right? But the process tells us where we need to go. So this withdrawal who's saying, I don't want to go deeper. I don't do feelings. I don't need to. I'm positive. I don't need to talk them into it. I just need to see how's that working out for you? Yeah. And how's that working out in the relationship? And just meet you there because that's where the emotions are going to be. But it's also interesting, too, as you say that I'm thinking about, you know, oftentimes the partner isn't even asking, you know, I think a lot of withdrawers think that it's overly complicated, that they're supposed to share these big things and cry every time. And that's not even what they're partnering for. They just want to be included in their humanity to be to be to have the withdrawer share that you know, the deeper, more intimate part of themselves that they don't share their innermost thoughts and feelings, even if they were really positive, like I had a great day today, you know, nothing really bad happened. But yet, if that's all it took to open up to your, to help your feel connect to you, where, where, where's the resistance coming from, from opening up and talking about that? Simple. Let's take the highlighter out there. Again, this is another critical mm-hmm. point that you're saying. Withdrawal re-engagement is the withdrawal having success with a live emotion. Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean they have to go to deep places, have these big crocodile tears, have their partner responding mm-hmm. to them, right? If a withdrawer can talk about, hey, when I feel really happy and we're on the same page, my world is pretty safe. And yet when you're not happy with me, that's a hard thing. That's beautiful emotional engagement. That is where they're at. This is their truth, right? Withdrawal re-engagement, I don't use the word vulnerability. It's really about them being authentic with themselves, being present and genuine, and just opening up that space to show themselves, right? And if they would do that and have success, if I was a withdrawer with being positive, it's really important to me feeling safe, and I can't maintain that because my partner seems to want something more, how could that not be hard for me? I might not have words for that, because that would mean going a little bit more into the emotions. But if I have a therapist who can meet me in that place of hard and not try to push me too fast and celebrates my moves as they're going to kick in, that are going to try to turn down emotion, I'm going to start having more success. Hmm. Hmm. I just got so many withdrawals thinking in my mind as you talk about that, you know, and this is all really good stuff. And, and, what I'm also wondering is stage two only about going to insecurity. I mean, isn't it also about longing to feel close and loved by our partner that even if we do feel secure, we still have a longing to be close and how do we convey our desire and that longing to our partner? Every, every emotion is not only communicates what the problem is, but what the solution is, right? Step five is about really sharing the fears, the, the negative views of self. Step seven is sitting in those fears and allowing the needs, the longings to come out. For most withdrawers, there's not a lot of space for that. 
right? So that's why withdrawal re-engagement is a slow process over many sessions. You're building their capacity over time to stay in their fears. And the longer they can stay in their fears, there's finally an opportunity to listen to what their heart would want in those fears. But most therapists are asking withdrawers in stage one what they need, and then they get surprised when they don't know. When that is so predictable, I can't really know what I need if I can't even sit with my own fear. Yeah. Right. So when you build that capacity, but it's good to know a list, like if my fear is failure, like what would I need in that place? Mm -hmm. Even the words we use, failure is not such a great, you know, it's not so emotional that shows our needs. Is it I need to be accepted even if I fail? Is it if I fail, you're, you know, you'll still love me, you'll still respect me. I mean, what, trying to help put words, how do I know the need is real is when they could ask it in a way I don't know the answer to the question. I think, and for a lot of withdrawers, I found it's will you still see me as a good partner, even if I fail. Right. That's a big one. Yeah, yeah. So you're really saying that, you know, part of, one of the biggest things of working with withdrawers is not to get too far ahead of them and try to push them into where we want them to be. It's to really attune to them, to not get into this battle over words like using sad and fear and, and things that are too big for them, but being able to understand, you know, I mean, we understand what frustration and disappointment is about. We can use their words and come into it with them and reflect that present process. And I think that's where it does get kind of tough is knowing how to reflect that. When somebody says, I don't have a need, everything is positive. Like therapists don't know what to do with that. They don't know how to get curious. We, that's, and that's the key. So when you say that, my curiosity says, I, don't know, I love how you do that. But anytime I start to push for some emotions, you remind me of how that's not so important to you. What's, what matters more is that you keep things positive, that there's something about staying in positive emotion that feels really safe for you. Thank you for sharing that for me. Right. I, I'm trying to honor what their live emotion is. Right. When my question is too far in front, I'm asking too, I, I'm asking for something that's turning up the emotional heat. You know, I have to be ready for these for these corrections, right? They, that's just the process trying to correct itself. Mm -hmm. But yeah. I don't also, because we're honoring these protections, you know, for me, it's name it, then honor the function. What are these, th these strategies trying to do in buying space and, and turning down the temperature? I want to honor that. But the third move is I'm always trying to return to, all right, but what was that moment before the strategy kicked in? Right? Because there was something emotional, something vulnerable starting to happen that your body said, all right, let's make, let's stop that from happening. There is a fear there. There is an insecurity. And I'm constantly trying to stretch that withdrawer to come back to that place, to see themselves, to recognize if they always leave themselves there, nobody will ever know them. The cost of this habitual putting up walls and turning down emotion is they lose themselves over time. Yeah. Right? So as we start to get withdrawers to recognize that, right, they start to fight for themselves. They're not, they're not standing up to placate their partner or perform. Stage two, they're starting to do it for themselves. Right? So that's step seven when we start to have these longings. I mean, so often you ask a withdrawal what they need. They say to fight less, for you to be less critical. Right? But that's just focusing on the partner. When you really get them to sit in that place of vulnerability, then asking for what they need and not knowing the answers. I want you to listen to a couple of these. Imagine a withdrawer saying, their truth is, I believe I'm flawed. No one has ever seen me here. Can you see me here and tell me it's going to be okay? You can see how they don't know the answer to that question. That's what makes it so risky. But it's also what makes it so corrective. That in these places where I don't like myself, and I don't show anybody because I don't want it to be used against me. It's actually my place of greatest need. Your love coming into that place is what makes the world a lot safer, right? No one has ever wanted me when I fail. Would you want me when I fail? I do not fight for me in these places because I feel like I don't deserve it. Can you fight for me here? No one has ever chosen me when I get it wrong. Would you still choose me? Again, notice how all these, 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 
these asks are coming from this terribly vulnerable place. And we don't want to be reckless when we get withdrawals. We want all this safety in place before we ask them to take this big risk. Right. But this is a great opportunity for the pursuer to be superwoman or superman. Right to show up in a place nobody else has to literally retrain this nervous system that the best way to handle that fear is not alone but in the love and embrace of your partner. Yeah, I love that. This is really really good. I feel like we could probably use a whole <laughs> two or three day training just on withdrawers because that it can look so diverse, you know, according to withdrawers and you know, being able to understand what you see in front of you, I think is one of the hardest tasks, yeah. one of the hardest skills to conquer in EFT. And, and uh, you know, like you said several times, our tendency is to try to get in front of them and try to push them, you know, or drag them into where we want them to be. And we end up losing them, dusting them. Can you work with a withdrawer who's, you know, a fixer is different than a withdrawer who's going to be very wimpy and say, everything's my fault, but they're, they're, they're apologizing to turn down emotion. Or you could have a really controlling, angry withdrawer who's saying it's all your problem. You're the insecure one, but they're doing that to create, to turn down emotion. So there's lots of different moves that these different types of withdrawers use. And that's why I don't want to force people into one box. It's about my curiosity in that moment. It's like, hmm, what are you trying to get out of that anger? I have this withdrawer who every single time I'm off or the partner's off, he lets us know it, right? And I'm like, help me out here. You have really good timing. It's like every time I'm not precise, you really want to be precise with your words. There's something about the exactness of the words that are really important to you. Help me understand that. I trust you have good reasons, right? It's meeting that withdrawer. And that withdrawer goes on because if it's not exact, then it's gonna, I'm going to run into trouble. So look how quick they're noticing something. That's a big takeaway for people listening to this. Withdrawers are so much better at emotions than I originally recognized. Yeah. So much of what they are doing in session is exquisite timing. When they are seeing emotion, they're doing a quick assessment, and they're already trying to influence that. Right? For people yeah. that don't want to do emotions, they're, they're doing a lot more of it than we realize. That's right. That's right. And there was something else, if I can think of it real quick before we wrap up. Um, oh, it's with the words where sometimes, you know, you're reflecting back and using their exact words. But right. somehow when you even when you've repeated the words they've just given to you, they're like, no, that's not it. And the all and you tell me, George, if this is right. The only thing that I've been able to figure out out of that, which I just sort of figured out recently, was that. I think something about hearing someone else say it, even though those might have been their words, is sometimes it sounds different. Like, you know, maybe you've had those thoughts, but hearing it out loud, something about hearing it out loud or hearing it from somebody else kind of clicks that maybe that isn't right. So even though they just gave you those words, they're it, hearing it differently. And they're like, no. It could be. Again, what I trust is I don't need to figure it out or explain it. They need to figure it out. So my curiosity is going to tell me where I need to go. If I reflect back and you say, no, George, that's not actually right. I'm going to say, Annabelle, thank you for that. Because most people just kind of agree with that. But you're making a point to say it was not right, that there's, there was something I was missing. This is your way of standing up. There's something important here. And that's really, it's really important for me to help you understand that. So thank you for that. So help, help me out. What did I miss? Do you notice how I did that? It's like a judo move. It's like, I'm not going to fight the person. I'm just going to take it and go with it and turn it into, you know, into a response. There is some beautiful information they've given us. We just got to try not to take it so personal. And a lot of times that's harder. I mean, I've done so much self and a therapist. You know, I came up with, with, with Lisa Palmer, the ACEs model and a hearts model and how do you help. But what I've noticed over time is a lot of us as therapists, we think it's self or the therapist because we can't access the emotion. But actually, if we had better training, we probably wouldn't have to have all these big things come up for us. How do we actually learn to be with these withdrawers in a better way? Instead of eliciting more of their defensiveness, how do we actually honor and get their way of being and, and really help them feel like, you know what, this is a good thing that I met with this therapist and opened up space and got curious. 
At the end of the day, the proof is in the results. When withdrawers feel like they have an advocate that really is helping them understand themselves better, why would they not want to do more of it? And it's just a lot that gets in the way of that. So for a lot of people listening, I'm sorry our training in this model, that's I think pretty amazing what EFT is trying to do, but it's growing. And we're trying to get better at helping you moment by moment what you're supposed to do instead of these grand theories that just understand human behavior. Yeah. George, this has been incredible. And, you know, just so much of the information contained in here. I hope, guys, you're taking notes because this is really good stuff, really good stuff on how to work with withdrawers. Now, you have some exciting projects going on that are going to be starting soon where people can learn more, where they can really fine tune their training. Can you tell us more about those opportunities? Yes, we have a, a team coming out with a, that Annabelle's part of success in vulnerabilities, a new website. The, the goal of this website is to train therapists what to do moment by moment. I've never had time to do these online things. I've been too busy traveling and training. And one of the benefits or the opportunities in this COVID is being stuck in my house and having the creativity to do some of these projects. But we're going to have a library of, you know, five to 10 live sessions. People always ask, and George, I want to see a session. I just never had a chance to do that. Now we're going to have a chance to, to look at the sessions. You know, it's one thing to see it from moment one till 60, right, and see that breakdown. Let's watch this session. Let's see what works, what didn't work. And again, that's become my new passion. I want to empower therapists to know what to do in the moment. I want to stop the tape and say, where are you going to, what were you trying to do? What intervention were you using? If it doesn't work, what would you do next? I mean, there's so many options and choices here that we're, oftentimes we don't even recognize. And that's how we slow down our own process. So people can look at that. Go to my website, georgefowler.com. We'll have those links and abilities to sign up and all this fun stuff. Excellent. And you just recently appeared on, uh, you did a talk with the head of the Everyman organization. Yes, they have global calls, a couple hundred men coming together, these withdrawers who don't want to do feelings. And then before you know it, they're all in these little breakout rooms sharing their feelings, being authentic, being real. That longing is stronger than all their training. I hope that's the good news people are hearing here. I've never met a withdrawer who doesn't have something they want to share if they have success when they want to share it. And I also just want to just mention to my, my podcast for play radio, talking about sex and really trying to even a lot of withdrawers, how do they get more present in their body and not just focus on their orgasm, be more emotionally engaged. Mm -hmm. You know, that's hit the top five and Apple iPad, Apple downloads or whatever else for, for sex. So I think we're, we're in exciting times. The EFT is hot. That's excellent. And I've recommended some of my clients listen to your podcast and they've loved it. So that's been really exciting. So guys, if you have, if you guys have any interest and, and it's great just to hear the way that they talk about these topics, it really gives you a frame of reference as to maybe how to relate this material to your clients. And of course, I'm going to put the links to George's websites and his podcast in the description for this video. And We Heart Therapy is now a podcast as well. So, you know, yeah. You get the benefit of the video, but, you know, if you're on the go and you don't want to use that Wi-Fi, you can also download it in your uh, iTunes podcast series. So that'll be exciting. And, you know, make sure that you follow George. You know, he's traveling the country, he's traveling the world, he's offering trainings, you know, as the world starts to open back up and we're allowed to do more trainings. He's constantly got something going and, you know, you can welcome him to your area. You know, if you want to have George come do a training in your area, please contact him. I'm sure he'd love to schedule something with your community. And, uh, you know, I just want to thank you, George, so much for being with us and just sharing your, your words of wisdom and your expertise with us. Well, thank you, Annabelle. You're, you're serving a great function for our community and, and your, your passion for trying to get clearer is exactly what all of us need. So we're in this mess together. Good job. Thank you. Thank you so much, guys. And, you know, don't be afraid to message me, to email me if you've got questions, if you've got ideas on topics, maybe you want to consult on a case. Any of the trainers who have been on my podcast are also open for you to contact them as well. Don't be shy. <laughs> Send us an email and we'd love to respond back to you. In the meantime, make sure that you guys hit subscribe. Thanks for staying tuned. More episodes are on the way.